Salut tout le monde, c'est Eric. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue dans cet épisode du podcast de Je joue de la guitare. Aujourd'hui, au menu, on a quelque chose de spécial pour vous. On a nul autre que Monsieur Joe Robinson qui va être en entrevue avec nous pour la prochaine heure. Pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas Joe, eh bien, Joe Robinson, c'est lui. Un jeune prodige australien de la guitare acoustique fingerstyle, un peu dans le style de Tommy Emmanuel. Il est maintenant basé à Nashville et il nous a accordé aujourd'hui une heure d'entrevue dans laquelle on va discuter de tout plein de sujets reliés à la guitare. On va parler de ses projets passés, présents et futurs et de plein d'autres trucs qui risquent fort bien de vous intéresser. La version audio de ce podcast aujourd'hui sera exceptionnellement en anglais, mais ne vous en faites pas ceux qui sont un petit peu moins à l'aise avec la langue anglaise. La version YouTube va être sous-titrée en français. Alors si vous êtes un petit peu moins familier avec la langue de Shakespeare, ne vous en faites pas. Allez tout de suite voir cet épisode sur YouTube avec les sous-titres. J'en dis pas plus, alors je vous laisse avec l'entrevue avec Monsieur Joe Robinson. Bonne écoute tout le monde. Hi Joe, how are you doing then? G'day Eric, I'm pretty well, thanks. Nice to meet you, mate. I'm really happy to have you on the podcast today. It's really cool. I won't hide it, you are one of my big influences finger style wise. You're a crazy player. Oh, thank you. <laughs> for those who don't know Joe yet, um, Joe is, uh, for everybody on the podcast, Joe is an amazing young Australian guitar player, um, a big influence for me and for a lot of folks out there too. Uh, he's got six studio albums right now, six, seven, six, I think. Yeah, I think six, yeah. Uh, countless EP singles, YouTube releases. He's got a thriving international career um, and uh, an online school too. You do a lot of teaching uh, on, your, yeah. on your website, yeah. And he is, he was, I have, to, I have to say it, he was the winner of Australia's Got Talent back in 2008 <laughs> when he was only 16, 17. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, was, I was 16 during the first episode and then when I won I was 17, so it was right in that window. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's just a real treat to have you today on the podcast. We'll chat about the, a couple of different subjects uh, and talk all around guitar for sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say congrats for your last album that just came out. Thank you. Uh, I, I just spent the whole month of December uh, listening to Christmas au Chalet. Great title, <laughs> by the way, great title. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, thank you. Yeah, it was, it, it was fun recording that album. You know, I, um, it's 13 Christmas instrumental arrangements. And I uh, recorded it in a, in a small chalet just outside Montreal, between Montreal and, and Quebec City. Um, between Montreal and Quebec City, near Three Rivers, maybe? Trois Rivières? Maybe. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. It's quite remote. That's where like I the, live. That's where I live. I, really? live. I live like right in between <laughs> Quebec and Montreal, straight in the middle. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, my, my wife is, is, uh, is, uh, is from Quebec. And so I was up there. I actually get getting her visa and everything organized for her to, to come to Nashville. And um, I spent about three months up there late last year, August through, yeah, August through November, actually. And uh, it was it was really a beautiful time. And uh, I had some some tour dates scheduled with Tommy Emmanuel for oh. December in kind of all, all across Canada. I was and supposed I, to go at Sherbrooke yeah. on November 28, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh huh. Ended up canceling. I wanted to see you. I saw Tommy like three or four times. Love Tommy Emmanuel for sure. Yeah. But I, I, I was there to see you. Next oh, time, thanks, next yeah. time. I, I would have loved, loved for that to happen, but I, I could see that the shows were going to be canceled. So I made plans to 
you know, I, well, I, I thought about what, what, what can I do with my time? And I thought making a, a nice Christmas album might be a good way to spend it. So uh, I, I was visiting this chalet and I, <laughs> and I just was appreciating how quiet it was out there on the lake. There was no sound sure. and it was just peaceful. And, you know, I, I went out there just to, to spend a week there initially. And I just played so much music. And I found myself just really inspired by the environment. And uh, uh, was it was it something that you already planned to do a, a Christmas album like everybody's doing it? So why not me? <laughs> Or it just well, happened like that? Last year I put out a video of Jingle Bell Rock, and yeah. uh, and it got like a million <laughs> views on Facebook, and it, it just got a lot of you know attention and shares. So I thought, wow, it's people like this the kind of swing Christmas songs mm -hmm. arranged for guitar. So I I mean there's certainly no shortage of of tunes to arrange. So I thought, yeah, it might be a nice way to just give people some holiday music. I think a lot of Christmas music has, you know, just a lot of production and there's strings and horns and different things. And so I thought, you know, there are a few solo acoustic Christmas albums, but uh, I, I felt like, you know, I, I could offer something some diff something different. And so uh, I kind of got the vision in my head and uh, and the chalet turned out to be the perfect place to, to, to record it because it was just so quiet and I could just focus on the music. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with how it turned out and I've gotten so many wonderful reviews and feedback from it, so it's been it's been awesome. My family seemed to enjoy it at the Christmas dinner. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I put that on the background. Really. My, 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 <laughs> my wife is almost tired to listen to it because like, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit uh, tired of um, Buble and Sinatra Christmas songs, I, I just played them too much and heard them too much. And it was yeah. <laughs> refreshing to have a fingerstyle album from uh, one of my guitar heroes. P oh, pretty th cool. Thanks, mate. My, my wife's <laughs> sick of it too. She's heard those songs so many times. I didn't know your wife, your wife was from, 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 from Quebec. Yeah. And sh she's planning to move in, in Nashville? Yeah, she's moved here now. Oh, she's moved so, here now. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, cool. so we were engaged for... Uh, Yeah, a good long while, a couple of years, trying to organize, you know, the visa for her to come here, and it's finally got it all organized. Man. Yeah, yeah, it's always tricky, but yeah, she's she's amazing, and uh, yeah, I love spending time up there. It's a beautiful part of the world. Did you take time to uh, in in the three months you were there? Did you, did you take time to visit a little bit, uh, see the restaurants, uh, the guitar stores for sure? I I saw a clip from uh, from you at. Um, Ebert Music, where I, yeah. I bought two guitars from him. Uh, yeah, I, I went in there to see Danny because they, they distribute Maiden guitars. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, so I went in there to say hi to him. I needed some strings, actually, because oh. you know, I was, <laughs> was going to make a Christmas album. I knew I needed uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of new strings because I always change strings between songs when I'm, when I'm recording like and did, that. And did you ask for him, do you have Christmas strings? <laughs> I didn't. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that, that they were really nice in there and uh, yeah I mean when I was in Quebec it was pretty much kind of locked down and everything so I've I've been in, in, in the past and, and enjoyed the city it's certainly a beautiful place All right. Um, I want to talk quickly about um, about Australia's Got Talent it's a little bit of what put you on the map back then um, I, the thing I want to know what kind of stage experience did you have when you got there, when you performed at 16 and 17, like, I mean, even at 35 now, after 3,000 shows, I still get sweaty hands from time to time on special occasions. You were like 17. Man, the, pe the performance is really, really solid. <laughs> and how did you cope with that kind of pressure at, at that age? Did you have a little bit of stage experience? That's an interesting question. I had quite a bit of stage experience. You know, I played in a lot of bars and pubs and with bands solo I played on the street um played in competitions like nice. music competitions that that kind of thing so I'd done a lot of that before okay, um you cool. know but by, by the time I was 18 I I and I was moving to the US I put together a list of a thousand concerts I'd played so wow. I was I, I was really active wow my, okay my a thousand concerts before 18 yeah uh, so I was I was I was really active, um, just playing out in Australia a lot. And Australia is the kind of place where if you want people's attention, you really got to bang them over the head with it. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> okay. it's like it's like you have to you have to be exciting. And um, and so I was used to, you know, 
ha- having to, to work to get people to pay attention. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. being said, uh, when when I first auditioned for the the talent show, I wasn't nervous at all because I had no idea what it was about. I didn't know it was going to be on TV. I didn't know. I didn't even know it was going to be on stage. Like <laughs> okay. they invited me to it, and I thought maybe this is me playing in a room, you know, for the producer or something. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and, and then and then they, they pulled me out on stage, and I was like, oh wow, this is like the real deal. So I I played and and had a good time. And then as as the show went on, I started to to feel the nerves more because I realized that you know there was a lot of people watching and. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they were telling me, you know, I had to play, uh, you know, cover songs. They told me that if I played my own music, no one would really recognize it. So, and, so, so I, I had cert, certain things to to to, to work with. Um, and at this time, you already around. you already had a, had a lot of compositions. You were, you were you were writing already at that age. Yeah, I had an album out, and um, yeah, I had a lot of instrumental acoustic songs that I, that I was writing. And that was kind of, um, yeah, you know, I used to play in bands and I would write songs with the band and, uh, and I won the national songwriting competition when, when I was, um, like 13, 14 for, for under 18 year olds. So okay. I was, I was really into songwriting and interested in doing that. Nice. Um, but when I, when I first, you know, heard Tommy Emmanuel and met Tommy and just realized that you could perform solo and, uh, and that was possible to have a, a, um, you know, a exciting show with a lot of musicality. I just was like, man, that sounds so great because I, I had a hard time finding other musicians who were as passionate about music as me. Mm-hmm. So Fingerstar was a way to be kind of self-contained. So at, at that time, you know, 15, 16, 17, I was writing mostly instrumental acoustic okay. songs. There's a, there's a really short gap between Birdseed and Time Jumping. And it's like, For me, when I listen, when I the first time I, I listened to Time Jumping, I was like, the arrangements are amazing, the playing is really so pocket right on, and there's a there are a lot of songs on that album too. It's not a it's not a twenty twenty five minutes album. It's a lot of songs, and yeah. to compose, arrange, master, and record all of that in like one year and a half, two years is kind of crazy. Yeah, when I first recorded Birdseed, I, I worked with a producer. Well, I rec- worked with a producer on both albums, and, mm-hmm. and they really helped me just refine the arrangements a little mm-hmm. bit. And um, and we had recording engineers to get the sound. Um, so all I had to really do was play and write the songs. But uh, I, I learned a lot during during that experience. And to anyone out there who's a fingerstyle guitar player, you know, it's really a great experience recording an album. And if you can get someone who, who has experienced, who can who can show you, you know how to go about doing that, it can it can really help. Yeah. You might just be, end up being able to record a Christmas album by your own in the chalet in Quebec City. <laughs> yeah, well, that was after a, a a lot of years living in Nashville, and and you know when I, when I'm in Nashville, I do a lot of sessions in different studios, working with a variety of producers and for artists and. Um, You do a lot of studio uh, work uh, in Nashville, not only for for yourself yeah. but for other artists. Yeah, yeah. I, I in the last like three or four years, I've been doing more and more of that, um, and I, I I do enjoy it. However, it's not like the focus of 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 what I'm, you know, passionate about. Mm-hmm. But it's it, it's good fun, it's good experience, and the people I work with are you know are wonderful. I I have a lot of respect for the way they, you know, approach production. So. It's, nice. it's it's good fun, you know. Cool, cool, cool. Um, when I when I discovered you first, I I discovered you with um with I think uh, a video of the song um, a song from your Undertones album, a Mindless the song, Mindless. Oh yeah. I discovered you with that song, and like a uh, one uh, one one and a half or two years ago, I, I I'm a little late on jo- on the Joe Robinson thing, <laughs> and. Um, I was really blown away. It, it, it had been a long time since I saw such a, a complete combination of skills in in one guy. Um, in your early albums, like uh, Birdseed and um, and Time Jumping, you're not singing yet. Singing yeah. ha- uh, happens like uh, at the third third album. That let me introduce mm-hmm. you. I think um, is it something that uh, came to you naturally, uh, the singing too? Because you've got a great singing. Uh, you've got a great soulful singing. 
for a white guy, it's a lot of it's a lot of <laughs> and it's really soulful and um, yeah, great R and B influence. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Jason Mraz with a little more a little more air. <laughs> but you really, yeah. really you really sound good. And oh, is thanks. It, is it something that you that that came to you na naturally, or you had to work on it also uh, as much as as a guitar? Um, both. You know, when I was playing in bands as a teenager, I used to sing, and I enjoyed. You know, I had a high voice. This is be before, you know, this is when I was like 11, 12, 13 years old. And I used to just sing this really high. You did the soprano high, high, part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd sing these like rock songs and uh, um, and I'd sing the, the high parts. And then my voice changed and I started doing, you know, when I was first approached by a producer, it was like, oh, you just play guitar so great. We should do an instrumental album. And I was like, oh, that sounds fun. Let's do it. So... So I started doing it and then I, I started doing more solo acoustic gigs and I just realized, oh yeah, this this is fun and um, and I just kind of forgot about singing. And then I started to, to tour a lot doing my own shows after winning Australia's Got Talent, especially in Europe okay. where I would go and play a theater and I'd play an, a 90 minute concert mm -hmm. and I felt like if there wasn't a song where I'm singing, it just was boring. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt, I just felt like it wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, as interesting a show as I wanted it to be. So I thought, yeah, I wanted to incorporate some some vocals. So I started to sing, and um, and and I realized that it, it really did take take a while for me to get comfortable with it, and for me to just figure out how to phrase a vocal as well mm -hmm. as play guitar and have the groove feel yeah, good yeah like just to keep the groove yeah. while you're doing such complicated things when i did um i did a cover of your song um what's the title um let the guitar do the talking oh yeah cool Man, awesome. it, it took me that's like, pretty hard it, to play <laughs> it took me two two weeks full time <laughs> <laughs> and i was like damn the, the, the finger part is really hard on on itself like if you need to if you want to keep keep your focus on, on, on the vocal and on the message, it's really hard, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. That, that's a good song for practicing it, though, because the voice just, it just ro rolls along with a lot of words and you kind of got to keep, keep the, the groove going with the guitar. It's definitely, but, definitely uh, a great challenge. <laughs> yeah, but, but I started to do it more and, uh, you know, I really do enjoy writing songs. I like telling a story through words and basically the way I see it is, You know, I sing and I write and I play acoustic guitar and electric guitar. You know, how creative can I be with those things that I do? I mm -hmm. don't really play slide guitar. Mm -hmm. I don't really play um, mandolin or, you know, yeah. a lot of people in Nashville play all these different mm -hmm. instruments. I, I really just play, you know, finger style guitar. I play with a flat pick sometimes. The, these are the tools I have. How creative can, can I be with them? And so, yeah, for sure. uh, yeah definitely interested in in uh, the so the songwriting aspect as well as you know arranging interesting guitar parts. And uh, and I'm doing doing a lot more arranging these days, which is which is fun. It's a great workout. What do you What do you enjoy most? Well, what makes you the proud What makes you proud the most? Arranging an already existing song or just composing something from your own? Well, I like playing my own songs most of all, but um, there's a real, you know, the, the last time I, we were talking about Tommy Emmanuel, the last time I saw Tommy, we were talking about what we've been up to, and I said, yeah, I've been learning a lot of great songs and creating new arrangements, and Tommy said, oh, that's so good. He said, I, do, I love doing that. I love just learning songs. He's like, we need to learn songs in order to be able to write songs. Yeah, that, that's, so it, true. If, that's so true. If, if you study the best songs, then, you know, Like my friend who's a great songwriter says, if you want to be a great songwriter, learn 30 great songs and then try to write the 31st one. So once you've kind of understand, under once you understand how great songs are constructed, you know, it, it makes you a better writer when, when, you, um, when you can just have that understanding because you know what a song needs. A lot of people, when they send me songs they write, um, the, the, a common question I get is, okay, I have this idea and there's this section and this section and then I don't know how to finish it and and I say well you know listen to any Beatles songs and there's rarely more than three sections there's usually yeah. like two or three sections and they're all strong mm -hmm. and that's really all you need for 
a, a song. A lot of instrumental guitar songs are short, you know, two and a half, three, three and a half yeah. minutes, somewhere in there. And uh, how can you make the most of that that time? And it's good to be repetitive, but it's also good to find different, you know, inversions of playing things and, and uh, you know, you can do it mo- modulations and things. I really love the way you approach this, like um, in your... Um In most of your songs, like, uh, uh, what's the, I learned um, Royal Flush, the, your song oh, from yeah, Time cool. Jumping, I learned that too, <laughs> and I love the, I, I love how you do that, all those little sections that are, it's, it's almost the same, it's almost the same, but you always find that little harmonic, oh, or little hammer on that was, that wasn't there in the first time you played it, and it keeps the, it keeps the focus. It keeps the focus on the song, it keeps the pace going, and it keeps the interest in, uh, in the listener. Yeah, yeah, I learned that from, from Tommy and Chet Atkins. Tommy would say, if you're arranging like a, a pop song for an instrumental guitar treatment, if the, if the song goes verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you can't just play the verse the same two, two times, because the words would be different if there was a, if there was a vocal. And that would tell the story. But on the guitar, you've got to find a different way to do it. So maybe you play it. A typical thing I do is I play it a lower octave and a higher octave for mm-hmm. each verse. Or I'll do a modulation. Some songs I find that, you know, if it's just a song that everyone knows so well, it's a real simple song, like Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen or something like that. Yeah. If you try to put a key change in, it just it just doesn't work. It's, it's just like... A little strong. No, that doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't need to happen. So it's it's it can be tricky. And some songs, you know, really like a key change some are, di- are different and, and they don't but yeah you're always just search, searching for a different way to articulate the melody you can also play it as a play play some harmony lines within the within the arrangement that's a nice way to do it but but yeah it's just kind of crafting um wh- when i sit down to do an arrangement because i'm arranging you know a song a week or so now i'll i'll first learn the song and learn the melody and try to get the melody to be as as it's phrased on the original because the thing that bothers me about a lot of existing arrangements of songs is they don't really pay attention to the phrasing they mm-hmm. kind of just approximate the, the melody and and um yeah there's a lot of you know what make that the nuance in the phrasing of the melody i think is is um a big part of what makes a song special so tell me often says that he approaches the guitar like always like make he's trying to make the guitar sing and I think yeah he, uh, he always says that and It's it's really true, yeah. yeah. The, the arrangements need when you when you can sing the melody. Uh, mostly, if it's a song that people already know, it's gonna be so important that the melody really sticks out. If it's a song from your own, if you want people to to catch it, it's even more important than that. Okay, that this is my melody, and I want you to sing it, even if you don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I just love melodic music, so yeah. Always just you know trying to. F- figure out the melody and then the 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 groove and the approach and the key and then you're trying to figure out okay how, how does the structure go what do i need how, how how can i put this together so it's a kind of fully formed arrangement mm-hmm. and uh yeah it's it's a great exercise to do that and it it um it helps me when i'm writing songs because yeah it's just it's just practice <laughs> practice or <laughs> arranging <laughs> Let's talk about practice for for, for a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, you uh, like you and guys like Tommy Manuel uh, and yourself and Doyle Dice and all those top shelf uh, guitar players. Um, people think that you guys spend eight hours a day in the basement like a hermit, practicing skills every day to keep such a performance level. But mm-hmm. can you walk me through what is like? A typical day in the life of Joe Robinson is some of it true. <laughs> well, there's there's uh, there are some misconceptions. Uh, I will say that anyone who plays, you know, at at a high level has has put in the hours. You really can't a- avoid doing that. Like I've I practiced eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours, you know, in the past. Been there, done that. Um, yeah, I mean, these days, if I get a really good day of practicing, it's like you know, three or four hours is, is, is great. Um, but truthfully, I could practice for an hour a day and still maintain my technique mm-hmm. because you get to a point where you've had enough experience and you've, you've um, performed your arrangements enough 
you know them. It's just a matter of kind of maintaining the technique and staying mm-hmm. warmed up, basically. Okay. Um, that being said, a typical day for me, I, yesterday uh, I, I recorded Hit the Road Jack, which I posted on YouTube this morning. Oh, wow. I can see that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was kind of practicing the song in the morning for you know about an hour. I did some voice exercises and I, and I practiced for a while. And I did some exercise and a handful of other things. And then I spent about six hours recording the song. So I spent about three hours recording the, the audio and, uh, and just honing the arrangement and figuring out what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And then, then I put the electric guitar on and I overdubbed the solo on top and, cool. and basically had it all being filmed and everything. And, and then I was editing it. And then I woke up this morning and for another three hours I was editing and just you know, just really tweaking the, the, the video and things. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time playing that song over, over and over again. Asked my wife, she heard it, you know, 50 <laughs> times or something. Um, so, so, so there's, there's a lot of playing involved, but that, I don't consider that practice because mm-hmm. practice is like sitting down. Most of my practice is working with a metronome because that's one of my big things that I want to get better at is having great sense of time. Okay. That's what sets Tommy apart, I think, from from pretty much every other guitar player is just he's just got such a great rhythmic feel and that Incredible comes from timing, playing yeah. play, playing drums you, you know, must and, have uh, great great left hand uh, left leg muscles because that <laughs> that sh- that leg is shaking like crazy when he plays <laughs> right yeah yeah no just you know the, the groove is so important if you're going to be playing solo because you know that's what well it's it's so important period you know it's so important in the studio because as, as a fingerstyle guitarist doing sessions you know oftentimes you go in the studio and you'll be recording with the singer and uh and you know the producer wants the option to put drums on top or he, want, he wants it know, on the grid yeah so it has to be exactly it has to be in time so you got to play with a click track mm-hmm. and make that sound and feel good and it's it's really difficult to do that especially with a simple type groove i think when you record your albums, do you have uh, uh, a click in, in in your headphones, or or it's just your inner metronome that's it's gone that is now crazy good? Uh, usually, I have a click going. You have a click yeah. going. Yeah. Um, so for some like for a ballad or something, I wouldn't, of course. But um, there have been certain songs I I haven't used the click, but on Time Jumping, I used the click on that album. I think Birdseed, I used the click on. I forget. Um, and when I'm working with, like, I have an album that's coming out soon that I've finished and it, it features upright bass and drums. It's pretty kind of, Ooh, nice. um, it's got a cool, cool feel to the production. And a, a lot of those songs we didn't use a click on. So we're all playing together in the one room mm-hmm. and, uh, and there's a certain magic to that when, when you have really good, like a really great drummer that, that, that can be nice because as soon as you take the click off, everything just feels, feels better sometimes. Um, But when I'm recording solo guitar like Christmas Old Chalet, I recorded all those songs with a click pretty much because I wanted it to be really tight. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a different challenge playing with a click than playing without a click. When you play without a click, the challenge is staying in, in time. And when you play with a click, the, the challenge is making it feel good. And yeah, uh, yeah it, it's, it's real, really, really difficult to, to, to nail, but, but it's, it's, it's good for us, you know, it's a good thing to practice. It's something that is so important, but so overlooked by, by so many guitar players. We spend, as guitar teachers here at Jeju de la Guitar, we spend so many hours every day trying to, um, to get uh, the timing of our students better. Because, let's say it, guitar players g- generally have a terrible timing. <laughs> We're always ahead, always ahead. <laughs> and it's really, it's really hard to... Uh, to to sit on the tempo and to try to develop the the ability to um, to to keep the to keep the hand going when you're flat picking and trying to do like um, eights or sixteenths and trying to keep the groove. A lot of people have a lot of big uh, of beginners have a lot of trouble, but even not beginners. Like I see people on stage really often that can't can't bang their hands uh, their heads and can't like stomp the foot um, to the beat when they play and it's it's a really really uh, basic mistake i think to overlook this yeah no it's it, it 
It's something I've always struggled with. You know, I used to always play things too fast. I still do sometimes. <laughs> and it, it's, it's funny, like, if you think your time is good, then you can almost guarantee that it's not. <laughs> but it, it, if, if you're aware of the inconsistencies of your time, mm-hmm. then it's pretty safe to say your time is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, because you know, the, the way I practice now is I use a metronome and I'll put it on the lowest speed, basically, and I'll use it on two and four. So it'll be one, yeah. two, three, four, mm-hmm. one, two, three, four. And I'll play, you know, whatever songs I'm working on. And sometimes just really simple things, just trying to get it to be perfectly in the groove and perfectly in the pocket. It's like you watch someone like Steve Jordan play drums. And uh, I have his drumming, like the DVD where he's talking about how to play drums. Yeah. And he's basically saying, just play a straight beat. And if you can make that feel really great, then you're ahead of almost everybody. <laughs> like that's that's really <laughs> what it comes comes down to is being able to play simple things and make them feel really good. And uh, yeah, I mean, no matter whether you're playing rhythm guitar in a band, or whether you're playing a complicated fingerstyle arrangement or a simple fingerstyle arrangement, yeah, it's really yeah. I mean, r- rhythm is the biggest element of music. I think is rhythm, melody, and harmony. And I, I don't uh, know who said it, but. I think it was Brad Paisley who said, "You can you can play any note as long as it's in time, it's going to be good. But if you play all the right notes in the wrong time, you're just bad." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's like you listen to, you know, some guitar players, and uh, you know, there's a lot of great guitar players who don't know any theory. Yeah. And and you know, there's a lot of great guitar players who. Um, You know, maybe they just play rhythm guitar. They don't play melodies, but but there's no great guitar players who don't who don't have good time and feel. Like that's that's just yeah, exactly. it's really really so important. <laughs> Trying to think, but there's probably there's probably some <laughs> who, who you can kind of hear, hear beyond it. But uh, but yeah, I mean it's a it's a big thing that I spend my time doing, and it's a big thing that I drill into to, to my students and people who who are asking me, you know, how to how to really get to the next level especially with finger style playing it's usually timing so timing guys so guys on the channel listen to the master keep working on your <laughs> timing please <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the the, the master himself tommy um, um i had the chance to to see him um, like i said three or four times uh, in, in quebec city uh, Uh, I met him uh, before one of the shows at the meet and greet, and he's such a nice guy, always a gentleman. And uh, we had a wonderful night watching the show. And I know he is one of your big mentors for sure. And but how does it feel today to have the honor to like just play with him on the same stage and be one of his friends? <laughs> yeah, oh, it's amazing. Uh, you know, Tommy's been really great to me, really generous to me, and I, I knew his brother Phil really well. Okay. And, um, you know, I met Phil when I was about 11 years old and he really, you know, was the first person to tell me that I was like, I was any good, basically. <laughs> he And so he really means, means a lot to me. And uh, I feel really lucky and I think lucky is the right word that Tommy and Phil were my mentors because there's a, there's a lot of great guitarists out there, but there's no one like like Tommy uh, out there he's really a singular you know person he's changed the instrument I think yeah and uh, you know I, I I've spoken at a few universities uh, music departments and and I, I, I'm not afraid to, to say this but uh, I say you got to really be careful who you listen to and who you take advice from because there's a lot of people out there especially especially the jazz the jazz guys who um, you know are just a little bit bitter and jaded and And, um, you know, music's got to be joyful and music's got to be about making people feel feel something and feel good. And Tommy is just an exemplar of that. And that's why he's such an, such, such an in-demand concert performer is because he just puts on such a great show. And he really gives it his all. He's just inspiring on every level. And it's, it's, it's a big honor that, that I, I can call him a, a friend and... Um, you know, he, he, he was he was pretty critical of me when I was younger in that, you know, I'd sit down with him 
and I'd just be so excited to to sit with like my favorite guitarist, then he'd say, "Now, Joe, you got to work on your timing, and you got to write songs with the better melodies." And, 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 and I'd kind of be <laughs> okay, oh, okay, okay. I, I will do. I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and you know, and he just he just always gave me good, honest ad- advice over the years, and and uh, you know, these days it's just a real honor to to share the stage with him, and and yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, something that we share, which is the, the, the teacher and motivator side. Uh, yeah. y- your website is full of information, um, charts, uh, PDFs, uh, tutorials, lessons. Uh, for anybody who wants to, um, to, to learn fingerstyle guitar and just become better musicians uh, overall, um, what would be your advice for someone who's like, in a complete rut. Someone who's like the, the typical, I can get my barred course to sound right student. Uh, mm-hmm. What would be your, your main advice for someone who is in that situation? Well, I think uh, yeah, it's really the same advice for everybody. And it's just like, just chip it away at a little bit every day. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can do so much. Like basically if, if you're a beginner guitar player, If you're just starting out learning songs and chords, you know you can you can just practice for 15 to 30 minutes a day, and within six months of doing that, you will be amazed at your progress. You'll be able to play a lot of songs, um, you know, as long as you don't pick up any kind of really bad habits. But it's pretty unusual. The, the main thing is to just stay relaxed, and um, and uh, yeah, don't have any tension in your mm-hmm. in, in your arms, arms or hands or shoulders or anything. If you just practice, you know, a little bit each day, then you'll be amazed at how much progress you make. If you're an in- intermediate guitar player, so you know you've been playing a little while and you just can't quite seem to get to the next step, like you can't figure out how to improvise or how to, uh, yeah, play more advanced fingerstyle arrangements, then it becomes necessary to to just be kind of pretty intentional about what you practice and how you practice. And still, like 30 minutes a day can be all it takes to, to really make great progress <clears throat> if you're pretty intentional about what you're doing. And, um, and I think you yeah, really if you need don't to have, have like a, if you don't have a Knicks game rolling on, the kids in the same, uh, in the same room <laughs> and like uh, so many distractions, if you can really focus yourself on 20 or 30 minutes a day, but really focused on something, that's, that's an advice and that, that's a good advice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it really helps to have someone who can you know steer you in the right direction whether it's a teacher mm-hmm. whether it's a mentor whether it's some buddies you jam with and just some kind of reactionary person um to to play for or play with um, um beyond that i i think you know if people are more advanced you know you've been playing on stage and you've toured before and that kind of thing and you feel a bit burnt out then I think the job of a musician is to play music for people. And I think, yeah. you know, there's a lot of meaning in that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are great musicians who maybe feel like uh, frustrated that no one's listening or, you know, just they, they don't feel motivated to create anything. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, it's just it's just uh our job as musicians is to is to give people music like that's it's really as, as simple as that so yeah you're right you know it's it's never been an easier time to share music with the world and create music and May, um, maybe like two years ago the, was a little bit easier you think maybe <laughs> well on on, on on stage do do you miss it like a, I, i know that you're one of the most proactive artists that i've seen since the beginning of the pandemic uh, your youtube channel is like going crazy and uh, uh, how many live from home did you do i've done over 50 now and you know i i, I will say you know for me to like fly to colorado and play in a in a theater to 350 people That's that's more difficult than going live mm-hmm. and playing to, you know, I'll have thirty thousand people watch the video on Facebook, and then I'll have, you know, five or ten thousand on 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 YouTube. You know, I I mean, it's it's easier than than, than ever to 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 reach an audience and give people yeah, music. You're right. Pe- you're right. And and pe- people need music, um, so. 
yeah, I think I, that's, that's been a big, big lesson for me this year is just how many people you can reach. And has uh, it been difficult for you to to keep yourself motivated, like being um, being deprived of the live, of the live side of music, of the live reaction of people? Is yeah. it something that you found difficult, or you quickly like? went with the uh, OK Studio setup and live from home setup and you found uh, you found yourself uh, fulfilled fulfilled with that. Yeah, I feel like the thing I really missed and knew I would miss was the the audience clapping and the live reaction like, <laughs> like you like you say. But I do get that from doing live streams. Like there's a there's an adrenaline and an excitement in doing mm -hmm. that 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 I that gives me that same thing. It's not as as good but it's still it's still good. Um, and as far as motivation, you know, I, I don't really have a backup plan. I don't really have, you know, a, a, a plan B. This is, this is what I do. I, I moved from Australia mm -hmm. to the U.S. to, to be a musician yeah. and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not letting any, anything stop me. And I'm really, I'm really grateful for the tools we have available and, uh, Yeah, I I don't struggle to find motivation in in that sense. I mean, the struggle is just just getting better and, and keep pushing beyond. And you know, it's like you put out 30 songs and then two of them will just pop, and people will love them. And then the other ones that maybe you liked even more like don't <laughs> pop as much. And so it's always just kind of like you don't you decide. Know, you, put, you don't. We don't decide what people are gonna love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So th 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 those are the challenges. Is just you know, just showing up and doing it. Cool, nice, nice, nice. Um, you have a nice guitar in hands right now. Uh, let's let's just do a little gear gear talk uh, quickly. Um, yeah. Uh, I you have a partnership with Maiden Guitars that uh, from Australia. Uh, can you just talk to talk to us a little bit um, about how how did how did this partnership uh, happen and uh, what is the final result of it? Yeah, I um, I've been playing Maiden guitars since I was teenager and uh, the guitar I've been playing for over 10 years is okay. um, a Maiden uh, custom shop custom shop guitar with a cutaway and uh, it has Tasmanian Myrtle back and sides and uh, I was really thrilled that Maiden thought that it would be worth making a production line version of that guitar so available for anyone to, to purchase the custom shop um, guitar is also available but it's it's you know a handmade instrument that they're much diff more difficult to find but it's made with the same tone woods Tasmanian myrtle back and sides mahogany neck rosewood fingerboard and spruce top and uh, it's, it's just a just a great instrument if you're a performing guitarist like you're going you know, to be playing through a PA at any point I think this is the best To, you know the ma maiden pickup system is, is AP5 um, is amazing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's really just 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 great It's just, I think, the best on, on, on the market. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's the kind of guitar that you just don't want to stop playing. You get the neck nice and straight. This has l larger frets than um, the other Maiden guitars. And it just plays so well. It sounds great. I used this guitar, which is, you know, built on the on the um, production line in the factory. I okay, used it okay. on the cr Christmas album, the, uh, the entire thing. So um, you can hear what it sounds like recorded. I think it's a beautiful sounding guitar, very balanced with this really nice mid range. How do you? And, yeah, uh, the, yeah, the great the, ta the Tasmanian Myrtle uh, is it called uh, the the tonewood? Um, yeah. How would you describe it compared to uh, to other tonewoods that are more more common? I, I've never heard uh, a guitar, uh, never tried your model too, and never heard a guitar with Tasmanian. Um, is it more? Is it closer to mahogany or? Uh, it's it's probably more similar to maple. Um, it's pr pretty hard and fast attack. Okay. Um, although I think it's a little darker and a little, uh, it has kind of well, it's been described as a throaty mid range. It kind of has throaty a throaty mid range. Love it. <laughs> it, it. It has a nice throatiness to it. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of beautiful tone woods out there, and uh, and you know, Maiden make use of of Queensland maple, which is yeah. a beautiful t tone wood, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Yeah, this this just has a little bit of a different mid-range voice, but it's it's a similar kind of response to to a, a maple, I think. And when you perform live, um, 
what do you bring with you? What is your, what are your, what are your, uh, your weapons of choice as comes to, uh, to picks, amps, um, I don't know, pedals, effects, do you use any of those? Or? Yeah, the amp I use is an Udo Rosner uh, DeCapo cool. 75. Okay. U Udo was the fellow who developed AER amplifiers. Yes, yes, I know. And, uh, you know, I've always used AER amps and I got the new DeCapo amp and it's, it's even sweeter than the AER, so that's what I'm using right now. And uh, I have a pedal board. Um, basically, with my acoustic, all I have is a is a tuner pedal and then a loop pedal. And I use the RC1, the really simple loop pedal. I use it RC1, with a foot switch. The, the really small one, okay. Yeah, I use it with a foot switch so I can switch switch it off okay. and, uh, and erase the file. Um, and with electric guitar, I usually use a Fender amp of some kind and uh, I usually have an overdrive and a delay and a loop pedal on the electric side as well. And that that's about it. I really don't, you know, I don't like performing with a whole bunch of pedals. When I go to sessions, I have a lot of sounds and different things I can, I can use. But if I'm on stage, I got enough to worry about without having to you know, <laughs> change pedals. And Let's all that, keep so. it short and simple and just play. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Your, your electric guitar tone is uh, really unique. Um, We've heard a lot of great finger style players uh, uh, along the years, but your electric playing, I just can't, I just can't put my finger on on who you remind me of when you play electric guitar. You really sound like yourself. Oh, thank thank you. I've been really influenced by Eric Johnson, Robin Ford, and Jeff Beck, and uh, as well as a lot of jazz players. Um, as well as a lot, of, a lot of rock players too. Um, but I feel like I'm always just having fun when I play electric guitar, you know, it's just, it's kind of like, you know, I'll play acoustic and I'll put down a little bit of a loop on stage and then I'll get, I'll get the electric out and play, you know, play a bunch of diff different things. And, you know, I have, I have some fusion, more fusion influences as well as more blues influences. And, um, yeah, I, I like players who, who are real touch players, players like Jeff Beck and Eric Johnson. Your just attack is like really, really. Touch. You really have a, a really focused attack. Yeah. Do you put like a very light strings or really stiff strings? It sounds really stiff. Like the attack is really, really like almost if you had um, uh, an acoustic gauge on on it. Yeah. Well, I have an acoustic touch, so that's part of the way I, I approach it. I use like 11s on electric, so not super light, not, not super heavy. Okay, okay. I use a pretty heavy string on acoustic. The top strings are fourteen, so Whoa, I I, 14. I put a I put a heavier high E on the on my acoustic guitars, but it's but it's a set of twelves. So okay, but with a with I a use. fourteen on top, <laughs> wow, yeah. it it must have a lot of punch on that eye on that on that high E. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so finally, um, how is twenty twenty two looking for you, uh, Joe? Right now, do you have do, do you plan to go back on the road? Uh, new uh, do you have new studio stuff coming? You talked about a new album that was already finished. Yeah, yeah, I have another album that I'm sitting on. I'm just trying to figure out the best release plan. I'll be making an announcement on that hopefully soon. Cool. I have a handful of tour dates um, throughout the spring and summer, and so I'm looking forward to 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 playing those. Crossing wanna, fingers. Yeah, anyone who wants to look at my tour dates, just go to my website, joerobinson.com. There's not a whole lot announced right now. But um, sure. yeah, I hope hoping to get out there and, and play more shows. I'm definitely intending to be, you know, continuing to share a lot of music on YouTube. And, um, and you know, I've, I'm working on some new teaching uh, course courses, as well as, you know, I have my Guitar Synergy channel, which I direct people to if they want to learn uh, you know a lot of great finger style songs um, that's kind of a teaching platform that I've enjoyed building up in the last couple of years okay. um, so yeah just just cr creating a lot of music a lot of arrangements writing a lot and uh, yeah just a, a lot of creative creative um, projects that I'm I'm excited to, to, to work on and and some concerts uh, yeah that's gonna be fun can't wait to hear that new album and uh, I hope that I will have to the pleasure to see you live uh, maybe someday uh, in, in Quebec City or Montreal uh, or I will just have to go to Nashville. 
<laughs> yeah, I hope so too. I hope to perform up that way before too long. And anyway, Joey, it's it's been a real pleasure for me to have you today on the podcast. Uh, thanks you so much again. Uh, all the community is really happy and grateful that you took a little bit of time uh, <laughs> for us today. In the meantime, I wish you all the best of luck for 2022. Uh, you and your girlfriend, and uh, take care of yourselves uh, back in uh, uh, back down in Nashville. Hey, Eric, thank, thank you so much, mate. Lovely to meet you and look forward to connecting with you in person one of these days. Yes, one of these days, for sure, man. <laughs> All right, take care. Et voilà, c'est tout pour cette entrevue avec Joe. J'espère que vous avez apprécié. C'est tellement un être humain qui est inspirant dans sa façon de parler, dans sa façon d'approcher la guitare en général. C'est vraiment un modèle incroyable à suivre. Peu importe le niveau où est-ce qu'on se situe, qu'on soit un débutant ou un expert, c'est vraiment des conseils qui sont universels. C'était un beau défi pour moi de dépoussiérer mon anglais qui était un petit peu rouillé, je dois le dire, mais quand même, ça valait la peine. Ça a été vraiment une super belle rencontre. Pour ceux qui veulent encourager Joe, je vous invite à aller vous abonner à son channel YouTube. C'est vraiment plein de vidéos incroyables, donc c'est vraiment du matériel super plaisant à regarder. Et ceux qui veulent en apprendre un petit peu plus aussi, son site web est vraiment plein de ressources comme on en a parlé pendant l'entrevue. Donc ceux qui veulent avoir accès à des partitions de Fingerstyle, des chansons de Joe Robinson, vraiment tout est là sur le site web, c'est super le fun. J'espère que vous avez apprécié autant que moi et que vous avez pu en tirer un petit peu d'inspiration, vous aussi. D'ici le prochain podcast Je joue la guitare, je vous dis mes salutations tout le monde, prenez soin de vous, à la prochaine, bye bye.